Okay, brethren, let us quiet, quieten our hearts down. And as we prepare our hearts to uh, receive, um, the, the, receive the word of God um, delivered by pastor, we shall sing a few hymns. So we shall begin our, our, by singing our first hymn, Hymn 413, Rise Up, O Man of God. Uh, so uh, we are reminded that um, as men of God, we should rise up from our spiritual lethargy and give our hearts, our souls, our mind, as well as our strength to the work of God, bearing in mind that we are serving the King of kings and Lord of lords. So as we sing our first hymn, may we rise up and, and, and meditate upon the lyrics. Uh, let us arise. Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of kings. Rise up, O men of God, His kingdom tarries long. just passed, that we can gather together to feast on your word. We pray, Lord, that may uh, the word that we, had, we have heard um, this morning as well as this afternoon reside in our hearts. And we pray, O oh Lord, that may we also um, bring thy word into application in our life as well. And we pray, Lord, that as pastor continues to, to speak forth from the, the, the theme of the combined retreat being what should the church leadership be, we pray, Lord, that a double portion of thy unction be upon him. And we pray, Lord, that uh, he will speak forth the tr thy truth with clarity. And pray, Lord, that if, pray for each of us that may we um, have teachable hearts, not just to be, and also pray, Lord, that may we not just be hearers of thy word, but also be doers of thy word as well. We commit uh, this retreat to, into thy hands once again in the, the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, let us sit down. Okay. The word of the angel of the Lord to Joseph in Matthew 1 verses 20 to 21 says, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, son and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So our next song is a Christmas carol, Good Christian Men Rejoice. And let's we sing this this hymn, may we likewise rejoice as we commemorate the birth of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, uh, which is the Emmanuel, which is being interpreted as uh, God with us. Uh, so we shall sing our next hymn, Good Christian Men Rejoice. Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice, giving heed to what we say. 
news, news, Jesus Christ is born today. All sinners before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today, Christ is born today. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye hear of endless bliss, joy, joy, Jesus Christ was born for this. He has opened heaven's door, and man is blessed evermore. Christ was born for this, Christ was born for this. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Peace, peace, Jesus Christ was born to save. Calls you one and calls you all to gain this everlasting all. Christ was born to save, Christ was born to save. The word of God in Ephesians 2, 19 to 20 says, Now that therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone. With that, we shall sing our next hymn, The Church's One Foundation. And as we sing, may we understand that the foundation of a faithful church is built upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Church has one foundation, is Jesus Christ the Lord. She is his new creation, by water and the word. From hell he came and sought her to be his holy the time to pastor, we shall sing one final hymn. 
um, the hymn is, Is Your All on the Altar. will continue in the series of message uh, what should the church leadership be uh, which is also the theme of this year's combined YFYF retreat pastor please
Let us pray. Bless us, O Lord, as we seek Thee by the outpouring of Thy Spirit into our hearts and minds and also by strengthening our bodies that we may not become lethargic and sleepy but be awake unto Thy truth. Thank You for teaching us and giving us the rest we needed this evening. Now we come to Thee once again seeking for your continued blessing upon all those who have gathered to hear thy word, especially that you may bless our young people, young adults, so that in time to come they may be a people with understanding and wisdom of God rise up to serve you in the offices of the church. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What should the church leadership be? It should be always understood as divinely commissioned offices filled by divinely appointed people. We are not supposed to create new offices in the church according to our wish and whims or following the managerial hierarchy or plans developed by human scholars of this world. We can't have CEOs in the church, for instance. We can't have people with secular ideologies and secular perspectives to be in the leadership of the church. God designed the leadership of the church. Christ being the head of the church, he has appointed ministers of the word of which prophets, apostles, prophets have laid the foundation and their work is done. And then what we have are those who are what I call after builders. Paul, like a master builder, laid the foundation. And those who come after him, evangelists and pastor teachers, build their own. And then we have administration offices. We can call them administrators. And they are the elders and deacons of the church. Now, I just want to say, though I did not go too deep into that matter of de all the elders and deacons, deacons do have a feminine version of it, deaconesses. And I do believe the early church had deaconesses. But they were not younger women. They were older women as 1 Timothy 5 teaches us. Let me just let you see that as well. So there are sisters here, but because you are all young adults, there's a long way to go before you ever can be a deaconess according to God's word. Uh, firstly, this is actually part of the earlier message. So you may want to jot down along the notes that you have taken for the first message. If you look at the section where I talk about deacons, you may include this there. In Romans 16.1, oh, thank you. Yeah, right here. Okay, so we had deaconesses, deacons, and if you look at Romans 16.1, we have a lady named Phoebe. And Apostle Paul introduces her to the church in Rome in this manner. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, and then she is further explained as, which is a servant of the church, a servant of the church.
a servant of the church. Now, the expression is such, it's not just saying a servant, but a servant of the church. And the word for servant there is the same word for deacon. So, if you take it as one phrase, a servant of the church, a deacon of the church, it really shows that she was holding an official position. She could have been a widow, an elderly widow by this time. And the reason why I said she, was, she could have been a uh, widow is because widows were considered uh, most capable of serving in official position, not as rulers, but assistants to assistant to the rulers, like elders, uh, because they don't have any attachment to husband, because husband died, and they also don't have children, because children are grown up. That's why they ought to be 60 years old. And this we see in First Thessalonians, sorry, First Timothy chapter 5, verses 9 to 11. First Timothy chapter 5, Verses 9 to 11. So in 1 Timothy 5, 9 to 11, we read about the appointees for deaconesses in this manner. Let, a, let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved, relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So when you look at verse 9, Apostle Paul is insistent that if you are taking a widow into the number. Now, of course, it's not saying widows cannot be a member of the church. So this number is not to do with membership list. Neither is it a reference to some uh, kind of uh, charitable list or people who need charity, uh, love or care for their needs. It's not saying widows younger than 60 cannot be considered uh, as needy. That's not what they are saying. So this list, this number or list that Paul is talking about cannot be about membership list. It cannot be about a list of people who are in need. But it's about leadership. Now, let me show you why it is so. Return to that portion, Ephesians, uh, sorry, 1 Timothy 5, 9. It says, Let not a widow be taken into the number under three, three score years old, that's 60 years old. Three score is 60, one score is 20, so three score is 60. And then it says, Having been the wife of one man. Now watch that. that. Doesn't it sound like the requirements for elders and deacons in 1 Timothy 3? Like a man must be a man of one wife. So this cannot be an adulterous woman. Even after becoming a, becoming a widow, she remained as a widow. She did not go after chasing another man. And she fulfilled her duties because she had children. You know, it's very important. Uh, young widows are allowed to marry, but some of the young widows have children, like some, some have one, some have two, some have three, but they still have this burning desire to get married. What happened to the children? They suffer a great deal because if she's going to bear children for the second husband, somehow uh, she will be... Uh, torn apart between the first husband's children and the second husband's children. And there will be lots of issues. 
uh, within the family. And uh, she can be caught in very difficult situations. So it is quite clear in Apostle Paul's thinking that if a woman is ever to be taken into the number as uh, officially appointed to implement the things that the elders would decide, then she must be a woman of character who is faithful and who fulfills a duty at, with great sacrifice. A widow who brings up her children without marrying another man is a woman of un, unexplainable sacrifice and commitment. That, that speaks about her refined character, very refined character. She prevents temptation from tripping her up concerning her God-given duty of being a mother to her young children. And that's why in the next verse, verse 10, it says, uh, she not only going to be a woman who remained faithful to her husband, but also she must be well reported for good works. So she, being a widow, did not wait for others to help her. She would help wherever possible. You know, there are some widows who say, oh, I have no husband. I must secure everything for myself. It's, uh, it's for me and my children. And they become more and more um, hoarders. Even rich widows, they are very, very scared to show hospitality because they are scared that nobody to care for them. So they say, as some of our modern smart Christians who are really greedy people who say, oh, Bible says we must save up for rainy days. Yeah, and save up for rainy days, I know that. But often they cite that expression in, in uh, the book of Proverbs to justify their hoarding, unwillingness to give. But this lady or this type of ladies who will be considered for the number that is the list of serving ladies are charitable women and also she have brought up her children. She brought up her children. That means they all became adults and they are on their own. They are not reliant on the mother anymore. This is like elders and deacons who are expected to have ruled the house well and brought up the children, faithful children. And so this mother is noted for it. There are some sisters who are widows, but they are so busy serving the church. They want to do that, they want to do that, but the children are wandering in the world. And they are not worthy to be deaconesses. And that's very clear. They, I'm not saying they don't love the kids, but they have forgotten that meticulous attention children need. And if somebody say, well, I did my very best. I did, I love my kids, I always talk to them, I pray for them, but they didn't come out good. So why do you blame me? I want to be a deaconess. Sorry, this is not something that you and I decide. God decided and God said, these are the expectations of men and women who should come to the leadership. Let's don't change it because you think you have done well enough. This could be just because God wants to show the church that you are not selected to be a deacon and just have to accept it. Or you are not selected to be an elder or deacon, whatever it be. And again, she have lodged strangers. She's hospitable. If she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. And then in verse 11, Apostle Paul very specifically says, but the younger widows refuse. Don't accept the younger widows to be in the leadership, in, in the deaconship. Why? Because they have begun to wax, wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. So if they say they are called to be deaconesses and then Suddenly, somebody shows interest. 
or she feels interest in a man and then leave that position. And that is equivalent to waxing wanton against Christ. Why? Because the offices of the church are not for people to enter in and leave as they wish. That is showing a tremendous disrespect for the head of the church. You remember we learned in Ephesians 4, the offices of the church are the gift of the risen Christ. And no one should take it lightly. This is one reason I've said many times and I want to tell you, if any young lady say I'm called to ministry, I want to be very careful about them. If they really want to serve the Lord, let it be very clear. There's only one way. They must be in all relationships and all activities fully, fully connected to the ministry. And I want to say to the men who want to be in the ministry, you must also have wives who are totally dedicated to the ministry in one way or the other. If I'm a pastor and my wife is a professional lady, she say my calling is to uh, serve some multinational company. I got big offer. I'm going to get 30,000 a month. Sorry, I don't want to stay home. <laughs> my ministry will be completely affected. Even though you have a burning sensation within you that you want to be a pastor or preacher or missionary or elder or deacon, but then your wife is thoroughly, thoroughgoing worldly person or materialistic person. I, I'm telling you, no matter how clever you think you are, no matter how much passion you think you have, you are not called because your wife is going to be a hindrance. In fact, not only your spouses will be a hindrance, even your children will be a hindrance. And that's why the scripture says those who are going to be elders and deacons must have faithful children. Remember how miserable some of the godly characters were when they have ungodly children. And we don't want to be caught in that situation. And in the New Testament, it's very, very clear. So, when you take 1 Timothy 5, 9 to 11, together with chapter 16 of Romans, verse 1, you can see servant of the church was a title that Phoebe had and it served well. The, another thing that I want to just show you quickly with regard to deaconesses is from First Peter, uh, sorry, First Timothy 3. Please come to First Timothy 3. And uh, when we look at the qualifications for deacons starting with verse 8, suddenly in verse 11, 1 Timothy 3.11, there is this verse that talks about women. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Now, no such statement about wives are mentioned uh, in the qualification for elders in verses 1 to 7. But when it comes to the deacons, it seems there's something a bit odd here. However, I don't think it's a, uh, it, is nothing, uh, it is anything wrong or any, any of such situation. It is actually a reference to, in my thinking, women who served as deacons in the office of deacons. Why did I say it? Verse 11 begins with the statement, even so. So just as men who fill the office of deacons, even so, in the same manner. You see, you look at verse 8, where the qualification of deacons begin. Likewise, 
It's the same Greek phrase that's translated here in verse 11, even so, likewise. So deacons must be like the elders. And then another group of people who serve, which are the women. Now the word wives in the King James Bible, in the Greek text, can be either women or wives. It can be either way. The word there is added in King James Bible. You can see it's in italics. It's not in the original text. So if you take the original Greek text, it would be, even so women be grave. Must there are added words in English. So I tend to think this is a reference to uh, women deacons. Like manner, women deacons be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. And then he continued, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling the children in their own houses and so on. So then it all concludes in verse 13 saying, they that have used the office of a deacon. So this is about those who use the office of a deacon, whether they be men or women. So those who use the office of deacon, well purchased to themselves a good, good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So from all those observations I made, I tend to believe there can be deacon, deaconesses in the church, but they must be women who are about 60, preferably unmarried women where the children are grown up, no more husbands to serve. Or if they are married, well, they better be very clear that the husbands are happy that they serve in the church fully. In my personal opinion, it's best that married women do not get into deaconess position if their husbands are alive because their first duty is not ruling the church but assisting the husband in their home. So if anyone want to really serve, any sister want to really serve the Lord, let them remain single. That's why in 1 Corinthians 7, we don't have time to go there. I've explained this several times in the church. If you study 1 Corinthians 7, Apostle Paul specifically speak to the younger widows and say, stay as I am, remain single so we can serve the Lord without being distracted. So the best thing for sisters who want to serve God full time is to remain single and serve. Because the moment you get married, it's very difficult. I, even in Bible Presbyterian Church, this is not clearly, very clearly taught. And that's why there's a lot of confusion. I see young girls. You know, there are young girls in Firestone Bible College. I've been watching since 1987 who studied with me. And after that, I taught some of them. And they come and give very fabulous testimonies. How convincing sometimes those testimonies are, the Lord called them. And then they... Soon after they graduate, they disappear into the world. After giving a fantastic testimony and the church support them with regular support. They, they, some marry police officers, some marry deacons, some marry lawyers, some marry businessmen and they never serve the Lord. So where is the service to which they are called? It cannot be God made a mistake. They made a mistake. You know, by allowing this kind of thing happen in the church, we actually reduce the sanctity and the seriousness of full-time work. In Bible Presbyterian churches, I don't have that much experience with other churches in Singapore and all that. In India, I'm connected to my parents' church. And I was a member of that church until I came over to Singapore. They do have, in India, a particular group of women who remain single to serve the Lord. 
In fact, they are called in my own language, Savinis. Savinis means those who serve. Literally, you can say de deaconesses. And their entire life, they serve the Lord and nothing but service to the Lord. One of those ladies passed away just two days ago. And uh, I remember her, how she visits my home, talk with me, pray for me. And then she goes to the next house. She teach young people, pray with them. And she lived all her life. And she was not married because she wanted to serve the Lord. There were, but <laughs> those kind of women who are fully dedicated to serve the Lord, even in that church, is reducing in number. Less and less people, young ladies want to enter the ministry. But many want to be married and then talk big that they are called. I don't understand. It, it doesn't tally with the scriptures. Okay, so I want to make it very clear in case girls who are listening to me, young ladies who are listening to me may wonder, so can I ever serve God? Yes, you can. You can. Remain single. But the church cannot easily accept you as full-time uh, person to appoint into offices because we don't know. We don't know whether you will remain single. It would take a long time before you be approved into any office at all. It's very difficult. So, If young ladies really want to serve God, let them remain single. That must be a vow before God. Otherwise, how are you going to serve full time? It's not possible. Now, nobody should think remain single and serving God is a curse. Nobody should think that way. Jesus was single, of course. Paul was single. There are many great servants of God remained single all through their life and they were the most dedicated, most passionate, most effective, zealous people. They achieve a great deal because nothing distracted them. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that factor and then I move on to the new section. Can't see, where is it? Okay. Wearing face shield and looking at things is very hard. Cannot see well. Okay, so we have already seen the divine design of church leadership. Now, in this meeting, I'm going to talk about evidences of divine appointments. Or divine commission. Okay, evidence. I shouldn't be saying evidences, evidence. It's only, you know, S for evidence. Okay, evidence of divine appointment. It's good for you to know, firstly for your own sake and for uh, the understanding of qualifications of those who claim that God has called them. You can study their character and see whether they are truly a people of God. Now, when we read the scriptures carefully, we see that very clear indications of evidence of divine commissioning in the life of those whom God has called. Remember, God not only designed the office, God also calls, ordains people to that office. It's, all of these are God's work. So when God calls someone for the offices he designed, he will prepare these people to fit that office. He will never appoint unfit people 
to the office he designed. So you must look for evidence. Firstly, there will be spiritual desire, or sometimes we call it burdens. The very first evidence is spiritual desire, or burden, as some might say. A compulsion within you. A constraining within you. Okay? Now, we were at 1 Timothy 3. When you look at the very first verse of 1 Timothy 3, it says, this is a true saying. In other words, this is a faithful statement. It's an accurate axiom that if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. If a man desire the office, you can see in 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, there are two different words. One is desire for the office. And the other word is desire for work. There are two different word, Greek words for desire. The first desire, if a man desire the office of a bishop, is a Greek word orego. And it means to reach after to reach out after or to stretch out oneself to grasp something. That's the first word, orego. Okay, so I will write it for you. This is the word orego in Greek. Orego means to reach after. You're trying to grasp something and to take it for yourself. It's more like an external expression that you have. But it proceeds from the second one. Desire for a good work. And the, word, the second word desire for the work is the word epithumeo. Sorry. I do have spelling errors now and then. <laughs> okay. So here you have a Greek word epithumeo epithumeo can mean a passion uh, a strong compulsion within you know something that you cannot, cannot suppress it's always there and it's increasing with time it keeps on pushing you pressing you so this, in, this is inner, okay? So this is the inner working of God in your heart. This is an inner desire. Whereas the first one is an external desire. From the heart, it goes out. So it begins with a desire for the work. So only when you have a desire for the work, then you should go for the office. It's not the other way around. Give me office, then I will do the work. That's not the way. In every man, we must see that he has a passion for the work that constitute the office. So if you want to have a person to be a pastor, what will you look for in him? He must have everything that... Sh that uh, fits the tasks of a pastor. He is studying, he is able to articulate, he is able to cohesively or coherently, uh, coherently express the thoughts in the Bible, he is able to express well, and he has the ability to communicate to people, he, is, uh, he has the ability to organize and uh, give leadership to people. Now all this Firstly, something that God creates within that person. 
So sometimes people ask this question, are leaders made or are leaders born? You might have heard this question people ask. Are leaders born or are, are leaders made? I think it's not so important for me to answer. Nobody is born as a leader. In time, the Spirit of God creates within them all the necessary uh, qualities, abilities, and so on. So it's not human made anyway. It's not natural anyway. So if you ask the question, are leaders born with regard to church leaders? I, my answer is yes, from the birth, they are marked out for leadership. That's for sure. But do, do, uh, when they are born, do they naturally inherit all of the necessary Necessary abilities and qualities? My answer is no. They are developed. They are spirit-given, right? They are spirit-endued gifts. But they may have some natural gifts that God gives right at the beginning, which will eventually become uh, useful in the ministry. But these are spirit-directed desires and abilities in a man's heart. So this desire within will express itself as he grows in the church and he will feel that he can contribute. He can contribute as a deacon or in time to come, maybe as an elder or as a Sunday school teacher, then as a pastor, who knows. And so there will be an inner desire which is, which is so strong that you can't put it aside. It's always there. But this desire is always not to the title, not to the office, but to the work that those offices constitute. So if you want to be a deacon, then you must have a desire to serve humbly. And if you don't show that, then you cannot be a deacon. Well, when we take these two t words together, orego and epithumeo, it describes the man who outwardly pursues the ministry because of a driving compulsion on the inside. Okay, so there is this unstoppable, unrestainable passion that drives him forward and he literally pursues the ministry. Literally go for the truth. There are some people in the church while they, they say, I want the office. I want to be this. I want to do this. But then halfway through they are not there. They are not around. Sometimes you wonder, what are these people doing? They're supposed to manage this. They're supposed to be around, but they are gone. And it would be terrible, it would be betrayal to the Lord Jesus Christ when you are given something, you leave it and then pursue something else. It's embarrassing. Total neglect. Your one passion and one pursuit has to be the work of God to which you are appointed. Some men seek spiritual oversight in the church because people they respect have encouraged them to do so. I remember someone came to me and said, no, Pastor Koshi, I'm hoping I can help you. I said, what do you mean? You see, so-and-so, who is in the full-time ministry, saw me drawing pictures. And I've been drawing pictures, and this, this full-time worker said, you can actually help Pastor to do the, daily, uh, the, 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 the Bible witness. You can draw so well. You must serve the Lord full-time because you serve. So this young man came to me and said, I hope 
I can help you. I said, why? He said, because so and so said, I can help. <laughs> That's the last person I want on board. Even if he's the best artist in Singapore, I don't want that person. Because a person is not called by God. Somebody said, maybe, so I want to come and try his luck. It's not because of an inner compulsion that he has. This is a very significant thing. Some people say, oh, I think I can contribute. Yeah, you can contribute. You don't have to be a full-time worker to contribute. I think I can help you with teaching. Yeah, maybe as a Sunday school teacher, we will consider that. But you don't have to be an elder or a pastor or a preacher to be a teacher. You can teach in Sunday school without being any of it. But you must have a passion to take teaching as the only thing you want to do. You remember in 1 Timothy 5.17, when we talk about elders, it says, especially the, those who labor in the word and doctrine. That's one pursuit they have. They have given their life to the teaching of God's word. It has to come from your heart. You must feel miserable if you don't do it. Let me show you this in apostolic language, what it means. In Romans 1.14, Paul said this, Romans 1.14, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. What did he say? I am debtor. I owe I owe to these people. Who are these people? Gentiles. They are non-Jews non because Paul was called to be a, an apostle to the Gentiles. And he said, I am therefore a debtor. I always feel I owe something to these people. They are Greeks and even barbarians, not so educated, nomads at that time, living off the ground. I want to go to them and preach the gospel. I'm a debtor. That's an inner burden that we talk about. An inner compulsion. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, 2 Corinthians 5.14, Apostle Paul said, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge if one died for all, then we're all dead. He said, well, because of the love of God that brought Jesus to this world, I have this constraining within us, within me. These terms are synonymous with those two Greek words I mentioned earlier. To talk about the inner driving of the spirit and the love of God. In 1 Corinthians, by the way, 1 Corinthians 9, 16 Paul said, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Look at that. Necessity is laid upon me. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Yeah, then he goes on to say, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is unto me. So there's this great burden which brings a person to the point of curse and death. If I don't preach, it's death to me. It is such a curse. Oh, I can't take this burden anymore. I must fulfill my debt. I must pay it by giving my life to do that work. So those who are called are moved with a passion that cannot be suppressed. Is that desire. Now you all can feel that. Well, if God wants you to marry a woman, you will have that. Not, not lust, I'm talk, not talking about lust. You feel like looking after her, loving her, tenderly caring for her, leading her, not serving her. If you're a man, you're not trying to serve her like uh, one who is submissive to the woman. 
You lead her, but lead by teaching and being exemplary, not by beating her up and showing your physical strength. That would be wrong. If any time such passions come out, we repent. We correct ourselves. But every time when the Lord calls you to be something, if it is from the Lord, God will give you the right feelings toward that. You can look at a few more examples I'm going to lay before you. Acts 18 verse 5, where Timotheus is mentioned. And we read, when Silas and Timotheus, Acts 18 verse 5, when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, it says, Paul was pressed in spirit. Paul was pressed in the spirit. For what? To testify to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Can you imagine that feeling? Being pressed in the spirit. That's a desire. That's a burden. That's a compulsion that you feel within. You can't stop. Now I must witness. If you go to chapter 17 of Acts, a similar expression is found. No, Acts 17, 16. Now while Paul waited for them at, the, at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. There was a stirring of the spirit within when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. When he saw that Athens was an idolatrous city, his heart was stirred to go there and preach the gospel. You can't resist that. He was pressed in his heart. He was stirred in his spirit. So there are various words used in the scripture to talk about this inner con uh, conviction or desire or burden or driving force. And that's a must. But I want to say this again. This is not about the office. This is not about the job. It's not some sort of adventurous thing that you like to undertake. But this is a desire for the work. The work. So if I'm a pastor, my greatest passion cannot be playing badminton or playing soccer or going for fishing or play, playing some stuff or doing business with people or be a counselor to businessmen, you know. Not, not these things. My greatest duty is to divide God's word. Sometimes people come to me for counseling, but I always tell them I have only one kind of counseling. It is preach the word of God to you. If you don't want to hear me saying what the Bible says, don't come to me. I have no counseling for you. And I also want to tell you, I cannot fix your, job, your problems. Only God can do it. I will tell you what God wants you to do from the scriptures. I will analyze honestly. If you are honest with me about reporting to, you, reporting to me about your problem, then I will tell you exactly what the Bible says. Now, if you don't respond to it according to Bible requirement, I am helpless. I stop my counseling. I don't want to waste my time around you. There's no problem. There's no point wasting time. I don't give counseling to earn money. I don't. I just give any time God gives me an opportunity to talk to some person, I will give them the word of God. And that's my calling. Of course, I'm not saying nobody ever give me a gift. Many gave me gifts, small and big. And if it's too big, I will find ways to return it to the Lord. Uh, I think some older ones may remember once somebody suddenly called me a doctor, a very wealthy doctor. And he said, Pastor Koshi, can you come down? He's not from our church. I know that man. So I went down. First time I'm going to his house. And when I went there, I was surprised. It's a huge house several multi-story building and I went in and he brought me up to the third level it's a beautiful studio 
specially made for his wife. She likes to sing and play music. And when I sat there, this doctor said, can you please listen to my problems? The wife is sitting there. I don't want to talk any further. But after that incident, it was very tr- painful. I came back. I told the church. I did not mention the name or anything. I just said, there's an incident like this. I'm counseling. Please pray. And our church prayed for that particular situation that I was handling. Two weeks later, this doctor came to visit me and asked me to go out with him for lunch. I said, okay, I will come with you for lunch. I went out with him for lunch, very near our church resource center, a small restaurant. And I ate with him. After that, he said, Pastor Goshi, I have something for you. I said, what's that? He said, I just wanted to say thank you for the help you gave. It's an invaluable help. And I don't know where to turn to. And the Lord directed my thought toward you and you came down and I'm very, very grateful. What I'm going to give you is nothing compared to the help you gave me. I said, no, la, I just share the God's word, God's word with you. It's nothing. And he said, no, no, this is from the Lord. Please take it. So I don't know what it was. It was an envelope I took. But when I reached the office, I opened up $10,000, a personal gift to me. I said, oh, that's a lot of money. $10,000. Three months salary wouldn't make it up for me. Four months salary will not give me that amount at that time. So it was big sum, 10,000. I still remember I came to the church and I told them the next Tuesday night. <laughs> One lady was sitting there in our church, got very angry and she said, Oh, so if he got 10,000 from one counseling, how much money he must have earned by now? Which bank did he put all the money? I tell you, she made a big ooh about it. Caused my life very miserable after that. But this is what I did. $3,000 of the 10000 was given to Ruben's grandfather. At that time, Ruben's grandfather was visiting Singapore, visiting brother Benny, Ruben's dad. And one day he to- told me, oh, our church back in India, need renovation. Pastor Koshi, would you pray? I said, sure. So I took 3000 and gave to him at that time. And he was so, so grateful. And he kept saying, thank you. I said, not from me, not from me. Uh, someone uh, gave this money and I'm giving it to you. And I gave 3000 The rest, I think about 5000 over, I gave to the church. The 2000 I kept for my own personal ministry and use. Now, Sometimes God blesses us with lots of money. But if you are called to serve God, you don't look at the money and say, oh, I pocket all of it. I'm telling you, honestly, you want to make money, be a pastor. Okay? You can get a lot of money. Serious. Serious. You want to be a millionaire? Be a pastor. Welcome. You can make a lot of money. You can do a lot of tricks. You can preach two sermons and then you can make money secretly. You invest. You know, somebody give you 10,000, you invest. Lah. Now you have a lot of investment methods. Sir. You think I don't know? I also get temptations, okay? T- turn on YouTube only, all the things will come, right? Passive income. How? I also can spend my money, to, time to read that and make money. God forbid I do that. It's a curse. A cursed thing to do it when I'm in the ministry. Uh, if I get 10,000, what should I be thinking about? Lord, what do you want me to do with this? <coughs> God takes care of all his servants. So the desire in you is not toward making money, not toward making a name for yourself. All this will come. Don't you think I'm quite famous? What do you think, Elder, Elder Joy? I'm pretty famous. I, I'm surprised by sometimes how, much, how many people come to know about me. It, it's not that I want. I won't go and put advertisement. When I went to Wysak, <coughs> Brother Sujit Samuel, our preacher, 
put a big banner outside his building. Reverend Dr. Prabhadas Koshi, MD, THM, THD, giving lectures. I said, can you take that down? It's so embarrassing. But one good thing he did, he didn't put my ugly picture on it. You know, some of them will put the big picture. It's common in India, in Africa, everywhere you go, you can see gospel preacher, lecturer from that university, Far Eastern Bible College professor. They will put all these up. Sometimes it's to attract people, but I don't like all these. I don't even like to put in front of my name, reverend and doctor. I, as much as possible, I don't put it there. I'm very happy with the word pastor. The reason is not not to say it's a wrong thing to say or do, but we cannot get distracted. If you feel these are a distraction, you better take it out immediately because you you will be carried away. Okay, I'm not trying to criticize those who put reverend and doctrine in front of them. Let them do it. I still have respect for them, but everyone must decide for himself. Why do you do it? In some places, you have to do reverend so they know you are a Christian teacher or preacher and they will take care of you because of that. Different countries have different culture and so on. So in some places it may be needful. I can quite understand that. But everybody, again I say, must remember, our singular pursuit is to serve the Lord in the work that God has called us to do. And that must be a passion. And that's why Jesus reminded the disciples as he talked about discipleship itself. He said in Luke 9.62, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If this is true about Christian life, Luke 9.62, if this is true about Christian life, how much more it's true about full-time work? No man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You cannot have distractions. The spiritual drive, that spiritual desire and burden should always guide you until you reach home. Okay, so this is a great truth that we can continue to study at some other time. Now, let me tell you the second important evidence, which I will call a spiritual discipline. Second evidence, spiritual discipline. You see, in 1 Timothy 3, 1, there are two words for desire, of which I said the first one is reaching out externally. You are always focused on that one thing, the office. And it is a result of the desire for the work. And I therefore would like to say, those whom God calls to the leadership, are marked by both an inward consuming passion and a disciplined outward pursuit. A disciplined outward pursuit. It's not gathering, going after this and that. It's not trying to gather everything into his pocket. He's very disciplined for the office. If anything is not fitting to that office. If it would somehow damage the reputation of that office, he wouldn't want it. So whether you are a pastor or elder or a deacon or a preacher, you shouldn't get involved with things that will give you a very different appearance. I'll just give you a simple example. Okay, this may be very funny, but... You know, I, I, when I was younger, like in my early 30s, late 20s and early 30s, up to about 40 years old, I, look, I like fine things of life. 
For example, adult glasses, sunglasses. Always like nice sunglasses. But do you know, until today I've never bought even one and nobody gave me one also. So praise God. I always thought that, you know, it's good for the eye, but more quite stylish. Right? Quite stylish. I just, after a while I said, it doesn't look like a pastor. Look like a businessman, maybe a celebrity, very cool, right? And... And then I noticed what kind of uh, sunglasses are good. Oh, then I realized Ray-Ban. Oh, that's very nice and style. So if Pastor Koshi with the Ray-Ban, uh, you know, with that. It sounds it like good. Somehow, though in my heart I have a liking for it, every time when I think of buying it, I say, no, it doesn't fit me as a pastor. So I decided, no. There are many things that I liked, you know, fine things of life. They are not in themselves sinful, but it will give a different, different message. It doesn't go very well with my office. I am trying to be a fitting servant of God in that office of pastorship. Certain places, I cannot go. Though in itself is not a mistake or bad thing, I just don't want to go. Somebody said, Pastor, if watching good educational movies are okay, why don't we go and watch a, you know, educational movie in a cinema theater? I said, no, I don't want to go. Even though it's a good movie, educational movie, there's nothing bad. So I don't want to go to a cinema theater. You know how it looks like? It looks like, Pastor, you know, they have other advertisements also, right? Half-naked ladies, pictures. Then Pastor Koshi come out, nope, then they take a photo and I'm just under this funny picture. What will people think of me? I just try not to be in those situations as much as possible. Of course, sometimes we can't help it. We pass by the place and then somebody take a photo. That's different. But I don't want to be caught as much as possible. There are many, many aspects in life where disciplines are seen. Certain disciplines. Can you imagine if I like to run, jogging, then somebody gives me Nike uh, shoes and Nike apparel. And one is a singlet and the short is up to here, cut, you know, almost up to the hip. It's for men anyway, not ladies. Ladies wear that. <laughs> but men also have this. Then I'm taking photograph with oh, Pastor Cool running. People can see up to my thigh. I mean, what is this? I like swimming, but I refuse to go for swimming. I don't want to jump in with quite, quite a number of ladies and all that. Hey, Pastor Cool, she is here, everybody. All in the swimming trunk and I'm also in underwear looking stuff. Jumping in and like a frog. I mean, wh wh what's the big deal? Just imagine, I, I have to be this comical maybe. I actually, it's not comical. I'm telling you the truth. But why are you laughing? So it's funny. That's what most people do. You know, I was really distressed when I attended many of the BP church camps in the 1980s and 1990s. Because after a good message, you come out after prayer, you see a, a group of ladies in the swimming trunk coming down the lift. Hi, you're going, you're coming, Pastor Kushi, swimming, swimming. I look at these ladies, I feel like, where am I in a nightclub? Oh, what is this? They're all ready to jump into the pool. I never forget one of the prominent BP churches invited me to preach in the night messages. That's the only time they ever call me. Never again. In the church camp. My wife and I were there and I saw teenagers and the girls all wearing swimming trunks. Boys just in their, whatever you call it. <laughs> and then they are cycling. They're swimming. Cycling. 
and the girl's one leg on the seat and the other leg on the ground. They are talking to the boys in such a shameful fashion. And some are pastor's kids and some are elder's kids. That night when I went up the pulpit, I said, this is utterly shameful that our children behave like this and nobody has the guts to tell them this is despicable. Oh, they didn't like it that I was so plain and blunt. I'm not against you swimming, okay? Don't get drowned. Please swim. Learn to swim. But at least you can be a little bit more. I mean, for this matter, you look at the uh, Muslim women when they go to swim. At least they dress modestly. So it's not that we cannot. We don't want. You think it's okay. But pastors and pastors' wives and pastors' children must have disciplines that match the calling. Whether it's about where we go, the activities we get involved, all these have very serious, serious implications in our life. Look at the characteristics of elders and deacons in 1 Timothy 3. You will see so much spiritual discipline in them. If you look at the spiritual disciplines mentioned there in 1 Timothy 3, a bishop must be blameless. He must be very careful never to be blamed. That's one of the reasons I tell ladies in our church, don't sit with me in the front seat of the van when I drive, always at the back. Just don't want someone to say something. And husband of one wife, in other words, not adulterous, vigilant, always watchful. That's a very disciplined person, vigilant, always analyze everything. Sober, meaning thinking with foresight. You must be a people with foresight. You know what's coming. You are not intoxicated. I'm sorry, you're not, yeah. You have not taken any intoxicant substance and you are not in some sort of uh, daze. You're clear minded. You're sober. Of good behavior. Behavior that can be emulated by others as good. Good behavior. Given to hospitality. That's something I will talk of later. And then you look at verse 3. Not given to wine. No excessive behavior. No striker, not greedy or filthy looker, will not allow the heart to go after wealth. It's not about making a lot of money. Then, be patient. Teach yourself to be patient. Not a brawler, ready to fight. I met some pastors and elders who say, I can't wait to have a go at this guy. <laughs> When I hear a pastor or elder saying like that, I say, finish, this man is going to have a lot of problems. I can't wait to go, have a go at this person. He's too much. I'm going to give it to him. Here I go. This kind of spirit is very dangerous. Don't even say such things in your heart. It can be very dangerous. So you, if you look at the qualifications for deacons, similar things are said in verse 8. Deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy or filthy looker. So very well-disciplined people. A third important evidence is spiritual activities.
they not only have spiritual disciplines, they also engage in activities that are helpful in, in, uh, in the spiritual work. Okay, spiritual activities, what are they? Well, in, if, since we are in 1 Timothy 3, without going into too many texts, time is up. Okay, uh, let's look at chapter 3 again, 1 Timothy 3. What are the spiritual activities given to hospitality? You see, hospitable attitude, welcoming others, caring for others. That's in verse 2. That's a spiritual activity. And if you are going to be an elder, you must be apt to teach. In other words, you learn, you have good understanding of the truth, you meticul meticulously, systematically study. In fact, Apostle Paul told Timothy uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. So there must be that, the word study there means disciplined, a disciplined study, a disciplined study. So you must have spiritual activities that will prepare you to take leadership. Here, hospitality, apt to teach. Then again, if you look at verse 4, it says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Because a home is a small church. If I don't see you, or if the church doesn't see you as a man who loves his wife and takes care of the family according to God's word, we cannot have the assurance that this person will guide the church in the spiritual way. If he has been compromising in his home, he will sure be a big compromiser in a bigger platform like that of the church. So the spiritual activities of this person must be always taken note of. One that ruleth well his own house. If a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And then verse 7. He must have a good report of them which are without, even outside his behavior, before he is appointed into church leadership. We will see how well he is managing everything God has given to him. You know, there are some people who, for this matter, I must say, some people who enter into business and they collapse and they become bankrupt. Can we make him an elder or not? He may be a good Christian, okay? He may be a good Christian, prayerful Christian and all that. But somehow he doesn't know how to manage his, his business and he become a bankrupt. I think we must be very careful making him an elder. Because he doesn't know. Otherwise, you could wait and see. Maybe God allows him another opportunity and he learns his lessons and he shows that he, has, he will not make the same mistake and he's, match, he's doing well. Then, of course, there's a good testimony outside the church he has. Because when a person becomes bankrupt, he owes a lot of people. He owes the bank, he owes his consumers or suppliers. And then you make him an elder. Why oh, you this guy? I don't want to come to his church. He owed me a million dollars. Or he owed me 50,000. People will feel offended. So their activities within and without the church must fit the office. Spiritual activities. The last thing I want to mention is spiritual leadership. spiritual leadership. Now, what do we mean by this? How can we know whether this person has what it takes to be a leader? How do we know? Uh, 
let me just give you two areas that you should look for to see whether this person has what it takes to be a spiritual leader. First, his home. We already said about it. His home. Is he a spiritually oriented man in giving counsel to his wife and his children? That's very important. You know, there are some husbands, they're very, very caring, very, very much dedicated to the family. They take them for holidays. Speaking about Singaporeans, take, him, take them to New Zealand, take them to Switzerland, and every land, Holland, Poland, and everything. And then start Japan, Korea, and all that. Almost every, every, every year, two times, they fly out as a family. And there's a family man in that regard. That doesn't show he's a spiritual man. We also don't know what other places he's going to see. If he is going to Honolulu and Hawaii Beach, I don't think he's a very spiritual man. What is there to see? Unless he's visiting some church. If he's going to what, Las Vegas and Walt Disney, all these are big things for him. Well, I don't think it's very much of a spiritual journey but more of a materialistic kind of pleasure. But if you see a man insisting that we must attend all the church camps, we never miss that. If we ever happen to book for holiday, but church camp come, we're going to cancel that. Church camp is more important. That sort of commitment, spiritual leadership, not only providing daily for the family, but giving spiritual leadership and good advice to the wives how they should behave. The other day, I happened to read a piece of uh, writing on Mrs. Lee Kuan Yew, former Prime Minister's wife. And she was a very big supporter of Lee Kuan Yew, as you know. In one of the interviews, she said this, I know as an Asian woman what's my place as the Prime Minister's wife. And then she said something which I never thought that she has ever said. I said it on my own in our church. And she said this, I must always stand two steps behind my husband. And I said this to someone in our church, who is a lady, that you should stand two steps, at least two steps behind your husband. Now this doesn't literally mean every time your husband is standing there, you stand two steps behind. You understand the meaning, right? Because let's say your husband is going to be a deacon and you, you want to help him. So here we have in GMC, the, the, the YFYF retreat. And the husband is the leader and he's supposed to give direction. And then suddenly the lady wife goes to the husband and say, oh, you're so busy, so many things. Can I help you? Yeah, I will go and tell all these people. And the wife comes up. I, Hello, everybody. Huh? Let me tell you, my husband wants all of you to sit down. Yeah. You, when do you become a deacon? When you become a pastor? That's your husband's job. You don't take leadership place and start talking for your husband. You want to do anything? You go and tell your husband. Darling, it's time to give an announcement. You go and do it. That's the right thing to do. You don't take his place. Can you imagine Mrs. Lee Kuan Yew coming to National Day? Because her husband is having flu. Majula! <laughs> I think you all run away. It's weird. You can't do that. No pastor's wife is Mrs. Pastor. You know, when I was watching one American Baptist church and when the pastor's wife came, they said, this is the first lady of the church. I said, finished. It's like first lady of American, America. 
the first lady of the church. I mean, this is secularization of the church, isn't it? Something is wrong. I don't think my wife is not important in my life and my ministry. She's so, so important. Without her, I don't think I would have made this much progress in my life. And I must honestly tell you that. But if she have ever tried to score everybody because her husband is a pastor and she's tried to behave the way I have demonstrated now, I think she would have undermined my leadership in this church. So when we talk about spiritual leadership, we see how you actually teach your wife. If your wife has a bigger voice than you, it's a problem. It's a real problem. And if your wife is going ahead and you are like darling, darling, always subservient to her, it's very difficult. And then your children don't listen to you. They're thoroughly, thoroughly uh, worldly and secular. So spiritual leadership in your house is very, very important. Obedient wives and children. So um, various places like church, I mean house and also in the church. So before you be appointed to any leadership, we will, we, uh, the church will have opportunity to watch you. If you have been in Gethsemane BP Church for some time, you know, you don't need an assignment from the pastor to serve the Lord. You don't need an appointment in a committee to serve the Lord. Open your eyes. You see an old brother, old uncle sitting there and he, he struggles to wake up. If you have the spirit of service, what will you do? You go to him, uncle, can I help you? And hold his hand. If he has to go to the toilet, you bring him to the toilet. Or you bring him and give him a chair to sit. If you see somebody trying to open the heavy door and carry something in the hand, if you are a service-minded person, what do you do? You quickly rush there and help. Tuesday night, I don't have to announce, let the young men come down and help, please. Yes, sometimes I have to say it, but sometimes you can see. It's not chit-chatting and just running off to catch the next first train. If you can, you can help around. And when you start doing things, the Lord will open up more and more areas. So if you are helping a weak brother or older man to, to the bus station or to the taxi or something like that, you have opportunity to talk to the person and you get to know some of the needs of the person. So you not only help him physically, but you also probably say a word to comfort him and then you can report to pastor or elder something you realize is a need to help that man. And then we realize, those who are in the leadership, hey, this man not only has a heart to do things, but he also sees things. And he's, he's willing to help and he's also willing to advise or give some, some tips to the leadership so they can take care. I took a little bit of time on this, but it is necessary for you to understand these things. Without these evidence in your life, already well ingrained, nobody can be considered for leadership. You'll be disastrous. Okay, so let me wrap it up with just a minute or so. Evidence of divine appointment. First, there's a spiritual burden and that's very crucial. That's where it begins and that's where you go forward. And then you have a spiritual discipline. You will have spiritual activities and you will show spiritual leadership in God-given areas. May the Lord bless you and pass the time back to whoever is leading. Once again, Him 414 is your all on the altar.
Once again, it's a reminder to you, our bodies and souls completely to God. The AV crew is still preparing. for announcements.
Okay, we'll now close in prayer and then uh, I'll give some announcements. Let us pray. Lord, we thank Thee for a very blessed day of learning God's Word. Truly, there's no better place to spend our Christmas than to be fed abundantly by Thy Word. We pray for tonight's rest, that Thou will grant unto all of us a very sweet and good night's sleep. Prepare our hearts and minds again for tomorrow, where we come together either online or here in GMC to study Thy Word. We pray for Thy servants, our pastor, Brother Cornelius, Sister Abigail and Preacher Calvin, as well as brethren who labour behind the scenes, that Thou will grant unto them good health and strength to labour again for Thee. Lord, we pray that You may also watch over us and grant us safety even as we travel back home. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, brethren, we have come to the end of our day one of retreat. Trust that all of us have been blessed by God's Word. Uh, for brethren attending the physical meeting in GMC tomorrow, uh, please sleep early and arrive by 9.20 a.m. The morning devotion by Brother Cornelius will start promptly at 9.30. So see you tomorrow and blessed Christmas. Okay, you can cut off the YouTube live stream. Thank you.